So our next speaker is Christopher Lawson. He's a basic scientist. Um, he studies uh, mechanisms in the brain associated with epilepsy and muscle disorders. And he's going to talk today about his efforts to develop new treatments for those disorders. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, I think I don't need the microscope. Can everybody hear me? No. Should be no. no you better not. Yes. Okay. I shall put it on. One, two. Is it on? No. <coughs> I will be uh, continuing with today's attention to or uh, focus on uh, brain disorders and talk about um, disorder that we probably all know, but it's maybe not as well understood. So I try to paint a clear picture of what is actually a problem of neuron communication and of disorder is epilepsy. To put it in a global perspective, the World Health Organization has reported that neurological disorders make up for about 3% of all disease, all disease. And within the neurological disorders, we have the big four, there's stroke, which essentially means there's a blood vessel in your brain that's occluded, creating problems. There are the dementias that we already heard about uh, today. There are the migraines, uh, headache, related disorders, and epilepsy. And these big four make up for three quarters of all neurological disorders. This, by the way, is not a map, not to mistake that. It's just a, a fractional representation of what these different categories um, account for in neurological disorders. Epilepsy in itself is a half a percent all disease, which is quite incredible. Um, if, we, if we consider epilepsy, it's probably safe to say that we all know some person with epilepsy who is uh, uh, maybe somebody here in the audience is afflicted with this disorder. So it is uh, uh, quite a burden in terms of uh, global health. What is the problem in epilepsy? Essentially, it, it is an issue of misbehaving neurons. Neurons brain cells, they allow us to speak, to dream, to move about, and uh, we have a ton of them. We have about 10 billion of these neurons in our brain, and each and every one of these neurons makes connections to a thousand, maybe 10,000 other neurons. So it's incredibly complex. Here's a picture of such a neuron. Uh, a schematic really. You can see these arrows on there, they kind of, they indicate the directional flow of information that goes through the neurons, because neurons like to talk to each other. They do so with electricity. And because I mentioned the connections before, these neurons are connecting to each other to talk to each other, instead of showing the schematic here just by itself, let's put that in a little bit more natural environment. It's still a schematic, doesn't really look like this but at least it gives you a picture of how complex it's going to get. Single neuron with a couple connections coming in. And these little sparks are symbolic of the message that comes into the neurons that they're, that they're passing on. That's a single neuron. So what if we consider not a single neuron, but we go into the network of neurons? And now you start to understand the complexity that we have in the brain. It's incredibly complicated. Of course, of course, what is complicated can go terribly wrong. How many neurons do we have here? I don't know, 200, 300 maybe? So what if you have 100 billion of those in your brain? To give you an impression of the 100 billion is a very abstract number. It doesn't really say anything. You cannot imagine 100 billion. I've once heard you cannot really imagine anything beyond 10. So 100 billion, if you, were to if you were to count 
your neurons. Can you? You have I think I will raise this a little bit here, maybe. I keep bumping into it. If is this better? It, it's getting better. Keep one going. two one two. <laughs> if we were to count a hundred billion neurons, each second we would count three of them. How long would it take until we're done? Years. Years. Yes. I tested my daughter, and she went through the entire thing. <laughs> Thousand and fifty years if we were to count every single neuron in our in our brain. So that's the number that we're talking about. Now, that is inc inc uh, incredibly complex. What happens if some of these guys don't work the way they should? Be? To keep everything organized, I'd like to bring up a comparison of the brain. I think of the brain and the way it works as an orchestra. An orchestra. I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe I can turn this up. I don't know if there's a... Okay. So this orchestra being the brain, your neurons being the different players. It's all harmony, it's all melody, they all have their different uh, responsibilities. There's the woodwinds, there's the percussion, there's the strings. And everything works together, then you have harmony. But what happens if some of these guys, some of these neurons, step out of line? If they don't do what they're supposed to do, if they're doing something that is their own melody, so I put together a piece of music, it's based on Smetana's small down, and I interspersed sections of other music to symbolize what it would mean in an epileptic attack or in an epileptic brain, what that means to all of a sudden have these seizures come in. And you will know what the seizure is, trust me. It's a piece of music that I will be playing right now. Um, one thing you may want to pay attention to in this piece of music is it's very melodic in the beginning, lots of harmony, but then you have the attack. And then all of a sudden you can tell, well, that piece of music still makes sense, but it, sent, it sort of sounds off. And it keeps on going as such until the seizures stop. When I played it to my daughter, actually, she said, that's scary. So be prepared to maybe a little bit loud, maybe a little bit scared. Some people find it funny, uh, but that's, of course, not to make fun of, uh, of seizures. Imagine this going on in an epileptic brain. Imagine that goes on in your brain and you cannot turn it off. What are seizures? Seizures can affect the entire brain. They can affect part of the brain and accordingly we call them either focal seizures or generalized seizures. When only a fraction of the neurons, a certain spot is affected and we talk about focal seizures the patients usually are full aware, they can be not aware um, as well. In some cases, we have what's called an aura. The patient is aware of a seizure coming. That's a very rare thing actually to happen, but it's really a window of opportunity for intervention because if we can grab the brain at that point and stop the seizure from happening, it's really something uh, that should be explored and we actually do that in our laboratory right now. If the seizures are not only affecting part of the neurons, but they're affecting the entire brain, then we talk about generalized seizures. And there's a wide spectrum of how these seizures can look like. Um, apart from what we probably all know, the, the, the freezing up, 
of the patient and then starting to shake, that's a so-called grand mal seizure. We have seizures that are much more subtle and much shorter. So, uh, and actually the uh, length of the seizure and the apparent intensity does not speak about its severity for the patient. So patients may, for example, have absence seizures, and in these uh, absence seizures they just freeze for a moment, kind of lose that moment in time, and they come back. Or we have a myoclonic seizure, where the patient all of a sudden jerks, uh, just like a hiccup or a, a waking, well not waking up, when, you, when you're about to fall asleep and you have this, this uh, fear jerk of just about to uh, go into, uh, into sleep. It's not a seizure, but it, it looks like a myoclonic seizure. Usually seizures are self-limiting. Uh, that means they stop by themselves. They may last a fraction of a second, like an absence so or a myoclonic jerk, or they may last a couple minutes. But if they do not, we refer to that as status epilepticus, and that is a 911 situation. It seems to me that this microscope, is it rubbing? Is it uh, sounding funny? Yeah, I hear an echo, sort of. Yeah. I'll try and I'll turn this off. I think it is my jacket. One second. Let's try this. Okay, okay. I'll stick that to my time. So what can we do against seizures? There are, of course, antiviolectic agents. We have 25, 30 of them. Not all of them will help patients. In fact, one third of all epilepsy patients cannot be helped with pharmacological agents. So there is a phen phenomenal need to, uh, to, uh, in, to find new drugs, new anti-epileptic agents. If we fail with pharmacological intervention, we have other options. We can, for example, stimulate the brain electrically, uh, vagal nerve stimulation and implantation uh, of a device onto the cortex itself, onto the brain's uh, surface. And then more recently, what has been in the media, you may have heard about cannabis, marijuana, being used for epilepsy. That is a particular there is a particular type of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. It's an extremely severe um, epilepsy where babies, formerly normal, three months of age, no problem, all of a sudden they may experience a status epilepticus and then after that just relent the seizures. No medication helps. It's terrible. I cannot even imagine uh, what parents must go through and of course the patient itself. The children very soon show a decline in their development uh, why? Because during these seizures, the brain is bathed in a chemical that the neurons usually use to talk to each other. It's called a neurotransmitter. And it's fine, that neurotransmitter, but in excess, it's certainly not fine. In fact, it's going to kill the neurons. If you don't stop these seizures, it will get progressively worse. That's why we need to control these seizures. And it turns out that cannabis oil seems to have some beneficial effects. So we, uh, we are looking into it. We do not know why it works, but certainly it seems to be uh, functional. And for parents that are very desperate to treat their children, um, they will certainly make whatever, do whatever is possible to get to it. What are the causes of epilepsy? Unfortunately, in two thirds of all cases, we do not know. We have no idea where the epileptic attack comes from. Well, we know where the epileptic attack comes from, but not where epilepsy comes from. In the other one-third, we know what's happening, and then depending on uh, what the age of the patient is, we can pinpoint a couple of those that are more common. In newborns, for example, we have brain malformation. We may have loss of oxygen during birth that gives rise to seizures, electrolyte imbalance that also, also of course, later on important in, in cases of anorexia when we have complete uh, unbalance of, of electrolytes, internal bleeding. Uh, a sharing, for example, of the head during birth. Uh, in children and in infants, fever, very common that uh, children experience a febrile fit. It doesn't necessarily make it an epilepsy. It just means that at that time, the brain was experiencing too much heat and it would go and experience, a it would go into a seizure. 
if this happens repeated, repeatedly every single time a child, for example, takes a hot bath, then yes, we talk about febrile, uh, febrile seizure and febrile epilepsy. Uh, that's actually uh, um, more common. Then in adults, vehicular accidents, destroying parts of the brain, epilepsy ensues. We have, um, we have brain disorders, prion diseases. Kreuzfeld-Jakob could be one of them. We have a brain tumor that could uh, give rise to, uh, to epilepsy. And then in the older generation, we have, again, trauma maybe from falling. But here, predominantly, it is stroke, again, that you have a blood vessel in your brain that gets occluded in a certain part of your brain. It's simply not provided with the nutrients and the oxygen that it needs. The tissue starts dying. Or Alzheimer's, uh, like Dr. Carly talked about earlier. The one component here that I'm particularly interested in is genetic epilepsy. What is genetic epilepsy? Well, in genetic epilepsy, the problem is in your genes. We have roughly 3.3 billion letters of DNA, each and every one of us. And this DNA is the building instruction of how we look like, how we behave, essentially, to some degree. Um, a single error in these 3.3 billion letters is sufficient to cause epilepsy, sufficient to cause disease in general, and that is perplexing to many. Let me try and explain this. This is an example that I got from my daughter's uh, Common Core Science book. I like it. DNA is like a library. It's the building instructions for us. These building, these building instructions in that library, there's many, many books. Well, not so many in us. We have 22, 23 chromosomes, each chromosome being one book. In each book, you have chapters. Each chapter is the equivalent of one gene, and one gene are the building instructions for one component in your body. So how can a single letter create disease? And I've put down an example down here. If you consider the building instructions, this letter here. Small changes can lead to big problems. Wild type here simply means that's our way, the science way of referring to it as being the normal state, the healthy state. These are the building instructions, or simply a sentence in these building instructions. That's normal. What if we take a single letter out? Well, let's take out the S at the very beginning of the sentence. From the healthy state, small changes can lead to big problems. We take out the S and we shift everything one letter over. The, letter, uh, the sentence now becomes Malk, Hengask, Analiet, Obig, Problems. Makes no sense anymore. You took out one letter, everything is garbled. That particular piece in your body that should have been built from these instructions is not going to be built properly. One predominant component that stands out in genetic epilepsy are so-called ion channels. And these are guys that allow neurons, the brain cells, to talk to each other. I mentioned earlier that brain cells like to talk to each other using electricity. Well, ion channels are small pores in the neurons that allow charged particles to go in and out. They're very controlled, they're very selective. They will allow only one particular type of particle to go through, for example, charged sodium, or potassium, or chloride, calcium, and so on. Well, if these are the problems, how can we look at these problems in neurons? After all, neurons are so small, we can't even see them with our bare eye. Well, naturally, we're going to have to use microscopes, and we're going to have to use amplifiers, very strong amplifiers, instruments that make the signal, the currents that we measure, much, much bigger, because the currents that we measure tend to the negative ninth ampere. If I do this, that's more, more current that I'm producing right now. So we need instruments that are extremely sensitive and that they, uh, instruments that amplify the signal a great deal. How is that possible? Here's a picture of such a rig. It's called a patch clamp rig. These rigs are so sensitive because they need to record such small signals that if I stand in front of my rig and I just stretch out my hand and go close to it, I can tell. I need not touch it. I simply go close to my rig. By looking at my measurements, I can tell somebody's standing close to my rig. That's how sensitive it is. Why? Because my body is an antenna that picks up the alternating current from the ceiling light. So we need to shield everything. Just to put in perspective how complicated this all is and how 
time consuming in, in, in putting up these uh, setups. So what do we ask? We ask if there is an ion channel that causes epilepsy, does it still open properly? Is it faster? Is it slower in opening? Does it conduct less current? And then if we have figured out these problems, can we possibly throw on a drug that brings the behavior of the ion channel back to its normal state? That is the first piece of evidence that we need to go forward to test this drug in animals. If it works in the reagent tube in one neuron, does it work in a whole organism? So we introduce this mutation into an animal, and we call this a knock-in animal. This animal has that mutation, and hopefully it will also display uh, the epilepsy. And we give that animal the drug that we figure out can rectify the situation. Does that rectify the epilepsy in, in the animal? If yes, then we can progress that to the clinical stage, and then it's a couple more years. A long, long process, very time consuming. And that brings me to the end already. I hope uh, I've clarified a couple things about epilepsy. Epilepsy is a very common disorder. Every, well, one in 100 people suffers from epilepsy. It's a problem of unwanted, abnormal neuronal communication. And the drug development that is very necessary, it's extremely time consuming, as is what is true with, with any kind of drug development, because we have to first test it reagent tube, then we advance it into the animal, then we advance it into the clinical stage, 10 years from bench to bedside. And with that, I close and take your questions. Thank you.